Okay, now we're moving into part five of the reading of the socialist uh, response to anti-Semitism during the period of the imperial German state. That is to say, during the Second International, the debate on anti-Semitism and the so-called Jewish question in the Second International that flowed into the Third International, that is still pestering us in the here and now. Okay, now I'm going to share this. There we go. <clears throat> Here. And then. Here. Okay. The theme of Jewry's duty to stand up for the cause of general emancipation was, so, was also popular with Mehring. Take the introduction to Zer Judenfranke in his edition of the early writings of Marx, Engels, and LaSalle, the Nachlachsegaben. Okay. Because Jewry's political emancipation coincided with the bourgeois revolution, he argued there, Jewry, quote, became very democratic and liberal with the proviso that it would immediately betray democracy and liberalism should they obstruct, obstruct its own rule. We have seen ample examples of this over the last half century and can still experience every day how Jewish fellow citizens, whom we admired as relentless standard bearers of bourgeois democracy, only a moment ago become vicious reactionaries when the consequences of some civil right infringes on some specifically Jewish interest, unquote. This pattern, Mehring claimed, was, quote, as old as Jewish participation in the public struggles and was precisely what motivated Bruno Bauer's writings on the Jewish question, unquote. Mehring even quoted Bauer at this point. Quote, one cries out as if humanity had been betrayed when critics venture to examine the essence inherent in the Jew as Jew. The same people who watch with pleasure when Christianity is subjected to criticism are capable of condemning anyone who then also wants to subject Jewry or Judaism to criticism. The defenders of Jewish emancipation have hence appropriated the old position of fighting against privileges and at the same time granting Jewry or Judaism the privilege of immutability, invulnerability, and unaccountability. Do these sentences not sound as if they were written today? That's when they're talking about Judaism and the Jewish people. Now, there's some rhetoric, rhetoric of populists, populists of the right, who then claim that it is Zionism speaking in the name of the Jewish people are claiming immunity when in fact they're claiming immunity for Zionism, not for the Jewish people, because they don't represent the Jewish people. So, but a lot of uh, populists, you know, who are claiming to support the Palestinian struggle, fall for it. They fall for the Zionist argument, and they then claim that Jewish people have no right to anything. Okay, so here we go. Mehring then asked, as Schallbach rather aptly put it, this part of Mehring's discussion indeed owes more to Bruno Bauer than to Marx. Wistrich, too, remarked that Mehring thus offered an implied apologio, apologia for Bruno Bauer's anti-Semitic writings on Judenfrage. Unquote. Needless to say, Mehring's identification with Bauer sprung from his contempt were those he deemed philo-Semites. And on this count, the affinity between them is indeed conspicuous. Yet, as we saw, Mehring by no means stood alone with this perception that formed a set piece of the social democratic discourse on anti-Semitism and the Jews. The logic behind these arguments indeed bears more than a passing resemblance to the, quote, 
the conflation of right and morality, unquote, in Bauer's Judenfrage. Bauer claimed that the old renunciation of particular identities was the prerequisite not only for comprehensive human emancipation, but also for the granting of formal emancipation. That's pure liberalism. Thus, Bauer turned a, quote, legal act into an act of conscience, unquote. Yet it was precisely the rejection of this conflation that had formed Marx's point of departure in Zer Judenfrage. He began the first essay by paraphrasing Bauer's position. How did Bauer respond to the Jewish demand for legal emancipation? Bauer responded by saying, you Jews are egoists if you demand a special emancipation for yourselves as Jews. As Jumer, Germans, you ought to work for the political emancipation of Germany and as human beings for human emancipation. Or do the Jews demand equality with the Christian subjects? In that case, they acknowledge the Christian state as justified and thus also the regime of general oppression. Why should the German be interested in the liberation of the Jew if the Jew is not interested in the liberation of the German? Unquote. This response followed conclusively, Marx explained, from a line of argument that defined the issue as a purely religious one. Bauer addressed only the questions of who was to be emancipated and who was to emancipate, while failing to ask what sort of emancipation was actually at stake. And as Marx insisted, it was precisely in taking this approach that Bauer had gone radically astray. Clearly, then, Marx paraphrased Bauer's response to the call for Jewish emancipation, not because he approved of it, but because it epitomized just how wrong-headed Bauer's whole approach was. Uh, yeah. Time. With honey. In this respect, too, the stance prevalent among social democrats flew in the face of the position developed by Marx and Sarah Judenfrage. To their minds, Jewry needed to prove its entitlement to solidarity by demonstrating its commitment to the cause of general emancipation. Yet, in fact, so they never ceased to complain, Jewry was only too inclined to pertain, betray that cause to pursue its own particular interests. This clearly reflected the very conflation of right and morality, the rejection of which had formed Marx's point of departure in Zer Judenfrage in the first place. In short, the notions prevalent among social democrats, in fact, differed substantially from Marx's position in Zer Judenfrage. This does not, of course, preclude our discussing the socialist uses and abuses of Zerjuden Frage, as we will do in chapter three. It does, however, make it virtually impossible to credit Zerjuden Frage with formative influence on social democracy stance, even where it was actively appropriated. Oh, well, here it is, chapter three. The Socialist Uses and Abuses of Zerjuden Frage by Karl Marx in 1843-1844, in the two essays. <clears throat> As we saw, the bulk of the one published issue of the Deutsche Französische Jahrbücher containing Marx's Zer Judenfrage fell into the hands of the Prussian authorities, rendering copies of the volume extremely rare. Not least for this reason, one of the questions scholars try to evaluate the influence of Zeru and Fraga on the socialist movement have had to address is this. How well known was the text of Zeru and Fraga rather than its mere existence to socialists? And how easily could they access it? We may recall Sil Berner's suggestion that hundreds of thousands, millions have read Zeru and Fraga with the same zeal and the same fervor as they read 
the Communist Manifesto. Yet, while the manifesto was regularly being issued, reissued in pamphlet form in all major European languages, in Germany, for example, Sarah Judenfrage was not published independently until 1919, and that edition was produced neither under the auspices of the Social Democratic or the Communist Party, nor even by anyone still directly associated with either of them. Instead, it was edited by Stefan Groschmann and published by Rowaltz, whatever that is. There's a footnote there for the footnoters. Okay, yet Zara Judenfraga, or parts of it, were occasionally reprinted elsewhere. Roughly the second half of the second essay was published by Wilhelm Hass Hasselmann, 1844 to 1916, in the ADAV's Neuer Social Democrat on 20th of September, 1872. Hasselmann did so as part of a campaign with which the ADAV sought to enamor itself with the workers of Berlin by denying the SDAP the credentials of Genuine Workers' Party, Social Democratic Allgemeine Partei. Yeah, the SDAP was in fact infiltrated and steered by a group of intellectual Mullendammen, Mullendammer, a common anti-Jewish pejorative who were merely out to manipulate the workers, so the ADAV claimed. Oh, Hasselmann prefaced the excerpt from Zer Judenfrage by stating that, oh boy, quote, a fanatical Hebrew has committed the naivete of calling the editor of the Nayer Social Democrat, that is to say Hasselmann, a Jew eater, Judenfrasser, although by no means enjoy biting into Jews, quote unquote. Euchen Schreiber dies. Nun durch es keinen Gest mag, dann findet Juden aus be, be, aus be essen. We, not, we do not in the following want to enlighten certain easily offended individuals by presenting the definition of jury as presented by a, a man whom the anti-Jew eater in question presumably acknowledges as an authority namely Herr Karl Marx. There are Judenfrage in the mainstream socialist press. Okay. Hmm. There are Judenfrage in the mainstream socialist press. Among the mainstream Social Democrats, Sarah Judenfrage did not, in fact, resurface until 1881, when the bulk of the second essay was published in Social Socialdemokrat, the banned party's weekly central organ that was produced abroad and illegally distributed in Germany. Baunstein took over the editorship of the Socialdemokrat in January 1881, was therefore responsible for this publication of most of the second part of Zer Judenfrage. The details of the process leading to the publication are not entirely clear. <clears throat> In 1879, Bernstein had no copy of the Deutsche Französische Jahrbuch at his disposal. We know this because he wrote to Engels on the 19th of June in 1879, to inquire how he might come by these older publications of Marx and Engels that he, Bernstein, was missing. The Deutsche Französische Scheuer Bacher among them. Engels informed Bernstein on the 26th of June, 1879, that he was in no position to assist him and himself no longer had copies of some of the items in question. It has therefore been suggested that Kautsky most likely brought a copy of the text with him when he returned to Zurich from his three-month stay in London late in June 1881. 
shortly before the publication of the excerpt from Zer Judenfrage in Social, Social Democrat. How plausible it is to infer from this, should it be accurate, that Kautsky, in fact, prepared the text for publication and prefaced it while still in London, and therefore surely did so with the approval and perhaps even the direct assistance of Marx and or Engels. It's hard to determine. It certainly seems inconceivable, though, that Bernstein should have undertaken this publication without Kautsky's knowledge, and highly unlikely that he would have done so against Kautsky's will, had Kautsky expressed misgivings about Marxist's text. Okay, break time. Back. Okay, to resume the reading uh, of this part five, last uh, session of this part five, we'll go now to share, find the document, which is the book by Lars Fischer, the socialist, oh, the socialist um, response to anti-Semitism during the Imperial German state. That is the during the Second International. Okay. <clears throat> now. The preface to the first installment of Marx's text explained the decision to publish the excerpt from Zer Judenfrag as follows. Quote, Given the significance that the Jewish question has acquired again today, it should be all the more important to point to this article, the development in the almost four decades since it was written has only confirmed its content. Since, quote, Unfortunately, it is too long for us to print in its entirety. We only want to reproduce the, to our mind, most important passage, which deals with the social significance of Jewry. In so doing, we do believe, though, that we should warn our readers against picking individual, easily understandable passages out of their context. Otherwise, they risk assuming the exact opposite of what Marx, to our mind, develops superbly, namely, the so-called Jewish spirit is a product of bourgeois society. Based as it is on the capitalist mode of production, which, where Oriental Jews are not already a given, produces Christian Jews in America, for instance. It produces Christian Germanic Jews. Unquote. The emphasis on the so called Jewish spirit, that is, in fact, a product of bourgeois society, unquote, is as well in keeping with the second part of Zero Judenfrage, as, as it is in odds with prevalent socialist discourse on the matter. This makes the suggestion of a backdrop of recent debate with Marx and or Engels all the more plausible, which would suggest that Kautsky was indeed actively involved in this publication, given that he was the one who had just returned from London. In his much cited article on Jews and German social democracy, published much later in March 1921 in the Tuchschumpt, Bernstein took Hasselmann to task for his publication of part of the same text. Quote, Although Hasselmann was strongly opposed to Marx, Bernstein remarked, he couldn't resist the temptation to reprint the above quoted article in order to prove the correctness of his own opinions about Jews. Had Marx seen this article, Bernstein went on, without explaining why he assumed that Marx had not seen it, quote, he would undoubtedly have opposed it because his article had been written for an educated public which could be trusted to see the sociological implications of Marx's line of argument, but Hasselmann's paper was mainly circulated among early educated workers. 
Now, Bernstein wrote this four decades after the event on the need to justify the decision to publish the bulk of the second essay in the Sociodemocrat may well have seemed a rather more pressing issue than it did at the time. Even so, Bernstein apparently felt justified in publishing the text because he assumed that his readers, as opposed to Hasselmann's, were educated and could be trusted to see the sociological implications of Marx's argument. On the other hand, his decision to publish the warning that easily understandable passages from the text could, if taken out of context, suggest the exact opposite of Marx's opinion would seem to indicate they cannot have been all that certain after all, and quite rightly so. Given what we know about Bernstein's own attitudes towards Jewry at the time, his intention was most likely to demonstrate that Marx and his followers had no qualms about calling a spade a spade when it came to Jews, Jewry's indiscretions either. Yet their critique of the Jews was inordinately superior to that of the ideologues of the emerging anti-Semitic movement. Okay, that's it for now for me. That's part five. Ah, okay, now to upload it for you, to have share and use as an archive.